Welcome back to another mocked draft reaction. I haven't done one of these in a while. Um, I'm going to be doing the Lance Zerline one today. And then Maurice Jones Drew dropped his first one. His are a little bit more out of body, a um, little bit weirder. So that'll be exciting for tomorrow. Lance Zerline, this is 3.0. If you don't know ball and want to know ball, be sure to subscribe. Leave a like. Let me know in the comments your favorite and least favorite pick from this mock draft. Also, be sure to check out Mock Draft Magazine. Madness, day 35 of doing a mock draft every single day until the NFL draft on April 25th later today. So, number one, he says, as we move closer to the actual NFL draft, I try to lock in my mock process by venturing into each general manager's headspace and hypo hypothesizing what the thinking could be relative to draft capital needs and board in general. One of the best ways to get a feel for how a team might proceed is to scour its draft history for potential clues on which positions the organization prioritizes and the kinds of players that thrive in the building. Sometimes the information is right in front of your face. He said he decided to be a bit more aggressive with the trade market, projecting four first round deals. Um, <clears throat> we saw six in 2023 and nine in 2022. At number one, we have the Bears going Caleb Williams. He says, at this point, anything other than the Bears taking Williams with this selection would be a shock. I would agree. I mean, with all the news, and he's really only taking one thirty visit from my understanding, and it's with the Bears. Might as well write that in. Um, at number two, we have the Washington Commanders. Cliff Kingsbury helped Johnny Manziel win the 2012 Heisman Trophy and offensive coordinator at Texas A&M and handpicked 2018 Heisman winner Kyler Murray as head coach of the Cardinals. I see the commanders giving their new OC a dual threat quarterback. This would make sense. I don't love, you know, Daniels being number two, um, especially when you have, when you're seeing a guy like, you know, Fields go for a sixth. I think Fields is probably a better prospect coming out of college. Um, and, I don't know. I'm just not too high on Jaden Daniels. I mean, I think he's probably going to be a top 10 pick regardless, but I think for the future of their franchise, I think they might have a better chance going with Drake May. At number three, we have the New York Giants trading up in the New England Patriots just three spots to take Drake May. The Giants probably have to pay more than the standard trade chart would indicate since the supply of the quarterback position is dwindling, but the demand remains high. Brian Dable fostered Josh Allen's raw talents in Buffalo and could have a chance to do the same with the toolsy but inconsistent North Carolina project. I think, honestly, this would be a great pick for the Giants if they're able to get up. I would like this much more than them taking J.J. McCarthy. I think if you look what Brian Dable has been able to do with Josh Allen, you could argue that you could do something similar with Drake May. So I do like this pick. They probably don't have to pay a ton. It's probably, realistically, it might be next year's first. But to get your quarterback of the future... It'll be worth it if he pans out. At number four, we have the Minnesota Vikings trading up with the Arizona Cardinals. So this is interesting to me because I would think that if, you know, the top three went quarterback, 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 that maybe the Vikings would go up to five because I find it harder to believe that Arizona is going to move off Marvin Harrison Jr. if... Marv is there, and the Chargers seem likely to trade out, but he says in the wake of the Giants vaulting into the number three spot for a quarterback, the Vikings are still able to move up for a signal caller of their own by giving the Cardinals pick 11 and 23. I think it's probably going to take <clears throat> next year's third as well, maybe even a first. And, you know, kind of the story of the offseason has been Vikings trading up to go get a quarterback, and it looks like it's going to be J.J. McCarthy in this case. I don't hate it. I don't love it. I, I would like, you know, he's going into a great situation. So JJ McCarthy going here over the Giants or the Broncos or um, the Patriots are all better options, better coaching, better weapons, everything like that. Um, 
the Broncos wouldn't be bad because of Sean Payton. It's more their roster right now. Um, but overall, I think they would be probably option number two compared to like the Giants and the uh, Patriots. At number five, we have the Los Angeles Chargers taking Marvin Harrison Jr. To be honest, though, like if Marvin Jr. Marvin Harrison Jr. is here, I find it very very hard to pass up um, because the main thing is if Marv is not there, I could see them trading down to get some new capital. It is a new front office, new regime. Um, but Marv is just one of those players that it's very hard to pass up on. And that's why I'm kind of surprised he has the Arizona Cardinals trading up because unless I think if you're going to want the Cardinals to move off Marvin Harrison Jr., especially for you to go up and get a quarterback because they know you're desperate, it's to, it's going to cost more than 11 and 23. So Marvin Harrison Jr., get another weapon for Justin Herbert. I like it. At number six, we have the... New England Patriots taking Malik Neighbors. So they move down to six. They're able to get one of the best receivers in the class. They don't get their quarterback. Um, I wonder what other picks they got. I don't remember if it said. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't say. But you know, it might be one of the. It's got to be a second rounder, if not second rounder this year. But. I like the pick a lot. You got to start building your weapons at some point. And if you're not going to go quarterback and you're not able to get Marv, got to get one of the guys like Malik Neighbors. Don't know who's going to be throwing him the ball. Maybe Bo Nix or something like that. But overall, not a bad pick. At number seven, we have the Tennessee Titans taking Joe Alt. You know, you really complete this line here. Um, you don't complete it. You complete the left side. Skronsky, Cushenberry, or Cushenberry, Skronsky, Alt. Um, I think there's a very small possibility they go receiver or Brock Bowers. But to me, if Joe Alt is sitting there at seven, I find it very, very, very hard to believe that they pass on a guy of his caliber. At number eight, we have the Atlanta Falcons taking Jared Verse. Pass rusher or pass catcher, I think they have gone offense these last couple years and they are chasing that edge. They were trying desperately to get Daniel Hunter. They were in on all these other edges in free agency. They're calling about Hassan Reddick. So to me, you didn't get any of those guys. You have to take them. They were in on verse last year and verse here. You know, I like Dallas Turner. I don't understand the hype of edge one I think all these guys are edge one um and honestly I like first and Latu a little bit better than Turner uh, I think Turner is really good and you know I think he's more of like an outside linebacker I know these guys I, I were versus more of like a true like edge player on the line um but overall good pick I think they could also trade back and possibly get Latu At number nine, we have the Chicago Bears taking Romo Dunze. He goes, every time I put together a mock draft for the Bears, I keep coming away with Caleb Williams and an ultra-talented wideout. In this case, they sit tight with the ninth pick and land a terrific ball winner. Honestly, they really do need a pass catcher. I love the idea of Romo Dunze, Keenan Allen, DJ Moore giving Caleb Williams all the weapons he needs in order to be successful. Now, here's the thing. Keenan Allen only on a one-year deal, and usually the Bears will get their extensions done sooner rather than later. But I just think that even if you extend Allen for a year or two, having Odunze as your third wide receiver, you have to do it. You have to do it if he's on the board. You run the ball. You run the clock in. Run the run the fucking pick in. I don't know why I couldn't get the words right. Um, but yeah, I know not a home run for the Bears here. To leave with Caleb Williams and Romo Dunze. At number 10, we have the New York Jets taking Brock Bowers. Um, They fixed their offensive line for this year. I wouldn't be surprised if they also went tackle or traded back a little bit and still grabbed a tackle to maybe recoup the second round pick they lost. Brock Bowers gives them an instant impact player. It's kind of tough though because usually tight ends take a little bit while to develop and Aaron Rodgers is not all that comfortable with trusting rookies right off the bat so 
I like the pick logistically. If you want to impact player now, it could work, but also like tight ends come on late. So I don't know. I think tackle would help them in the long run, but they're trying to win in the next two years. At number 11, we have the Arizona Cardinals. After trading down for foreign exchange for a pair of first round picks from the Vikings, the Cardinals grab Dallas Turner. So with this being the case and they go pass rusher with their first pick, I'm going to go ahead and guess that they grab a wide receiver later, and this is probably the smart move because with the top three guys off the board, you're going to be able to get a Brian Thomas Jr., Adonai Mitchell, probably not Brian Thomas actually, Adonai Mitchell, um, I mean, with 35, you could also go corner and then take a wide receiver at 35 because... You know, Keon Coleman's going to be there. Jermaine Burton's going to be there. And that might be a little high for those guys, but Troy Franklin might be there. So you have options. Um, Dallas Turner at 11, I like the pick, gives it a freaky athletic player for Jonathan Jonathan Gannon to work with. At number 12, we have the Denver Broncos taking Quinion Mitchell. I personally really like the idea of taking a cornerback. at 12, I also like the idea of possibly trading back, getting some picks, and being able to take Bo Nix and Michael Penix, not and, or Michael Penix in the second round. Quinion Mitchell and Terion Arnold are CB1A, 1B for me. I think either would be very, very good. Um, I tend to lean Terion Arnold a little bit more. I just trust the pedigree of Alabama a little bit more than Toledo, but, you know, Quinnia Mitchell is still insanely talented. Pairing him up with Pat Sertan, you have some of the, one of the best secondaries in the league for quite a while. At number 13, we have the Las Vegas Raiders taking J.C. Latham. So this surprises me a little bit, especially with Fuaga still on the clock. I think he fits kind of what the Raiders want a little bit more. Latham is not a scrub by any means. He can play right tackle. He can play right guard. Anyway, you are kind of supplementing and um, making that O-line a little bit better is a good pick. I could also see them going with a corner here like a Terry on Arnold. At number 14, we have the New Orleans Saints taking Olu Fashanu. Honestly, the more and more we get closer to the draft and the more Olu has fallen, with the penning ram check situation in New Orleans, I find it very, very hard to believe that if Olu is sitting here, you don't go left tackle, or if one of the top edges, like, I mean, Latu's here, but you have the medical history. I feel like he will drop quite a bit. Um, not quite a bit, I should say, but farther than probably where he'd go. If he, if he didn't have the medicals, Latu would probably be the first rusher off the board, in my opinion. Um, but Olu, you know, he can be that pass protector for the future for them. At number 15, we have the Indianapolis Colts taking by Ren Murphy. First interior defensive lineman off the board. I really like this pick um, in terms of the fact that their D-line is loaded. But I think maybe moving back, taking receiver or taking Brian Thomas Jr. here or taking Tyrion Arnold here would be a better move um, just because you want to help develop <clears throat> Anthony Richardson. You want to improve that CB room. Your line is already kind of pretty good. So this is just making it better. I don't hate it. I will never have an issue with taking a trenches pick, <clears throat> but I think maybe they view him as best player available. And that's the approach they're taking. He said, figuring out the Colts is a challenge in terms of what position they will address here. What we do know is that Indy regime covets traits and trench warriors. Murphy's undersized, but the DT might be too talented. Okay. Yeah. So BPA basically at number 16, we have the Arizona Cardinals trading up with the Seattle Seahawks. After initially trading out of number four, Arizona uses the draft. So like I was saying, they probably wouldn't have been able to get Brian Thomas Jr. back there. They use the draft capital Monty Osford has been collecting to move up from 23 to this slot in order to grab LSU other high ceiling speedster. Wow, that took forever for me to read. I like this pick a lot. You're giving a 4-3-3 big body guy to Kyler Murray. I think this makes a lot of sense. And now, if you go get a corner, you have addressed so much. You could also even go <coughs> tackle or into your offensive line. So I think this is a very good trade um, for the Cardinals. And 
I actually love this is probably one of my favorite trades that I've seen in mock drafts because it makes so much sense for the Cardinals and it makes a lot of sense for the Seahawks. In my opinion, the top need for the Seahawks is going to be interior offensive line. Fautanu, JPJ, Graham Barton, any of those guys. But taking them at 16, maybe not Fautanu, but taking them at 16 feels very, very rich for all of them. Like I said, maybe not Fautanu. I could also see him going 10 to the Jets because of his five position versatility. This now puts Seattle in a spot where if they take a guy like that, that's where they're probably going to start going anyway. So it gives them options and added draft capital. I love this trade for both teams. At number 17, we have the Jacksonville Jaguars. They are going to take Terran Arnold, and I could not like this more. Pairing Terran Arnold with Tyson Campbell, it's probably the biggest need. And when you have arguably the best cornerback in the class sitting here on the board, Trent Baalke, you have to take him. Put the Titos away and just take this guy. I don't understand what Trent Baalke does a lot of the time, um, but if this talent is on the board... You just have to go get them. At number 18 to the Cincinnati Bengals, they take Troy Fautanu. Okay, so they go interior offensive lineman, tackle-esque. They have Trent Brown. They have Orlando Brown Jr. Trent Brown's only there for one year. So maybe, I want to see what he actually says. The talented Fautanu offers the versatility to compete for the free, with the free agent addition Trent Brown for the right tackle spot or immediately start at left guard. If this is what the Bengals require of him, either way he upgrades since he's pass protection. Honestly, that's might be the go. That might be the plan. Put him at left guard this year. <clears throat> Trent Brown leaves after this year. Play him where Trent Brown was. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, you'll be set up for the future. And this, this is an instant impact move, which the Bengals want because they're competing for a Super Bowl every year. The team is only going to get more expensive, especially with Jamar Chase coming up. So in my opinion, if you're not going to go like a Jerzon Newton or a Leatu Latu, this is the way to go. Or if you don't add a receiver, but maybe you add a receiver round two. <clears throat> At number 19, we have the Los Angeles Rams taking Leatu Latu. This makes a lot of sense for me. You can pair him up with Byron Young. You lost Aaron Donald. There's no replacing him. You could also go uh, Jerzon Newton to try to fix that interior a little bit. But Leatu Latu and Byron Young is going to be a good, good combo for quite a while. And I love it with what the Rams are doing, just taking talented players and... Um, I'm very excited to see what the Rams can be this year. I think they could maybe make a Super Bowl run. At number 20, we have the Pittsburgh Steelers taking Talisa Fuaga. Fuanga. There's an N in there, even though there's not. Pairing Fuaga with Broderick Jones might be a little bit nuts. Like I I really like the pick. I don't think Fuanga is going to make it to 20. But if he does, this is probably one of the easiest picks the Pittsburgh Steelers have ever had to make um, other than pick 32 last year with Joey Porter Jr. But very good pick. You have your two bookend tackles for the foreseeable future. At number 21, we have the Miami Dolphins taking Chop Robinson. So Chop is probably going to, his range where he can go probably starts at like the Dolphins and then moves all the, you know, ever since 21, he'll be able to go. And, you know, a lot of people will make the argument that they already have the edges, but like he says here, with Jalen Phillips and Brandley Chubb both rehabbing from season-ending injuries, it won't surprise me if a Dolphins grab a veteran edge rusher in free agency and draft Robinson. Raw, but ridiculously explosive. The good teams and best teams in the NFL have a great rotation of pass rushers, and that is what Chubb Robinson is. So my thing is, you have to go and get the guy. You have to go and get guys that will build on your trenches and make the quarterback's life harder. So, would I like a JPJ here? Yes. Would I like a Graham Barton here? Yes. But Chop Robinson instantly adds in her pass rush. He has time to develop. He's not so he's not going to have to be that alpha one guy, and that is where I think he would struggle. He's going to be rushing opposite of Phillips, Chubb, and he's going to have time to build his confidence and learn a lot. At number 22, we have the Philadelphia Eagles taking Nate Wiggins. Um, I like the idea of Wiggins going here. I think if he added some weight, um, the Philadelphia Eagles do need secondary help. My... Um, 
Bradbury and Slay are getting older. Wiggins is very, very talented. He is 6'2", I believe, very long corner, very athletic. But the Forbes issue kind of scares me from last year um, in same division, which is funny. Obviously, A.J. Brown won't be able to bully him in real games, just in practice. But you get a very talented um, corner here. I could also see them taking a guy like Cooper DeGene. At number 23, we have the Seattle Seahawks who moved back with the... Um, Cardinals, and this is just what I was saying. They're in perfect place to take one of the best interior offensive linemen in the draft. He played tackle in college. He has five position versatility. He can play all inside positions. He can play both tackle positions. And they gather draft capital, get a guy who instantly upgrades their line, and takes them in a more correct spot of the draft. And if Graham Barton can be what he's supposed to be, this is a great pick for Seattle. At number 24, we have the Dallas Cowboys. The Cowboys choose to grab the talented but inexperienced tackle out of Oklahoma. Despite still being pretty new to the OT positions, guidance plus athleticism should allow him to step in and compete for the starting job. J- D- 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 the starting job at day one. Tyler Guyton is very athletic, very raw. We know what the Cowboys like to do. Um, they like to take... Um, home run shots. That line needs some help. I'm a little bit surprised Guyton goes in front of Amarius Mims, but Jerry Jones did say they're going all in. So maybe they think this guy can be a top tackle in the league and they're going to take the shot on him. I just think it's very risky, especially with the way the line looks now. At number 25, we have the Green Bay Packers taking Tyler Newbin. Green Bay Packers fans are going to hate this. They hate it whenever I do in a mock draft. He doesn't meet the RAS scores. He's not. A- Tyler Newbin is a good player, and you already have Xavier McKinney. If you play, if you pair those players up, you're going to be in a good spot. He is the best safety in this class. Cooper DeGene hasn't come off the board yet. I know you guys are going to want him, but I don't think this is the worst pick for the Packers. At number 26, we have the Washington Commanders trading up. So I like this pick a lot for them. They're going to take a Marius Mims. They do need a tackle. With the spot they're at in the second round, they can probably get a Jordan Morgan, but it's going to be like Jordan Morgan, like Kingsley Suamatia. And I think if you want more upside, you're going to go with a guy with a Marius Mims. He can play both tackle positions. He's just very raw. He only played like 800 snaps at Georgia, but he's extremely athletic. He's like 6'8", I believe, and he can be a great addition for a Washington Commanders team who desperately needs help on the offensive line. You don't have to play him right away, but you can kind of use the Broderick Jones formula where you let him develop a little bit, throw him in there later. At number 27, we have the Arizona Cardinals on the clock. They are taking Cooley McKintree. So, perfect. They get Dallas Turner, Cooley McKintree, and Brian Thomas Jr. Three SEC players, three very high caliber players, and this is what happens when you trade down and are able to grab players. If I'm a Cardinals fan... I would take this over Marvin Harrison Jr. any day of the any day of the week. If the board falls like this and you get Kool-Aid, Dallas Turner, and Brian Thomas Jr., you better build a statue of Monty Austin Fort. <laughs> At number 28, we have the Buffalo Bills sticking and picking and taking Adonai Mitchell with the departure of Stephon Diggs, Gabe Davis. This pick just makes too much sense. He's the best wide receiver left on the board. <clears throat> 29. Uh, Detroit Lions take Cooper DeGene, and if Cooper DeGene falls in the Lions' lap, they need to take him. He's someone who can play safety, he's someone who can play corner, and he is a football player. He is the type of football player that Dan Campbell looks for. Great addition for the Detroit Lions. At number 30, the Baltimore Ravens take a tackle in Jordan Morgan. This makes a lot of sense. They lost Morgan Moses, they have Ronnie Staley, and um, basically Tyler Lindenbaum. Their tackle or their the right t- the tackle issue. They have guard issues. They need to supplement the pick, especially because they don't have another pick until pick sixty. At number thirty one, well sixty one, I believe actually sixty one. At number thirty one, we have the San Francisco 49ers taking Darius Robinson. They need cornerback help. They need 
O-line help, but let's go D-line. Very, very 49ers. I'm not going to judge them because every year they have a very, very good trench group. So I don't love it positionally, but overall, good pick for the 49ers because I know they can probably turn him into a monster. At number 32 for the Kansas City Chiefs, Lad McConkey, Rasheed Rice. <laughs> I don't know what the hell is going on with him. And they have Hollywood Brown and Sky Moore. Like, I like Hollywood Brown, but they need more help. Sky Moore all pro season inbound. I like this mock. I think it has some very cool trades in it. So thank you guys so much for watching. If you don't know ball and want to know ball, be sure to subscribe. Leave a like. Let me know in the comments your favorite and least favorite pick from this mock draft. Shout out Lance Erline. His mock drafts are always super good. I always really enjoy them. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great rest of your day. Watch Mock Draft Madness Day 35 later today as well.